the energy section that we have in, in front of us now, it will be really, truly remarkable, interesting, because we have a fantastic panel. I will not spend a lot of time uh, introducing the subject. You will get a lot of interesting uh, introductions and perspectives, I'm sure, from our panelists. Just to say, you can see that my name here is Johan Schillenschana from the Stockholm Environment Institute. I was supposed to have a colleague here chairing this session. Unfortunately, she could not come uh, in the last moment, so I'm replacing her there. She is an energy expert. I'm not, so I'm very curious, rather, to hear and learn from, from the fantastic panel. Energy is fundamental, of course. That we know, um, and it's a fundamental part of the nexus that we are talking about. One, one signal, I would say, to the panel is not to forget that we are trying to speak in a broader nexus here. So just before, because we have energy in focus here, it's, of course, important to link to other aspects. Energy is fundamental for all development. And you can, displace this, you can display this in many different ways. Um, I, I like this picture from the International Energy Agency. I'm sorry for the quality somewhat, but it really you know, points at one interesting aspect of energy access, which is so important. We tend to focus, of course, on energy from the perspective of climate change and so on, but it's a, it's a fundamental aspect of development related to energy. No societies have developed without abundant access to energy. There's no question about it. And I think this graph shows you know, beautifully some of the challenges we have here. It's a few years old. I'm sure some people may question it. But what it shows is basically 40 terawatt hours up there, which is basically then the amount of electricity, access to electricity that you have in Africa, south of the Sahara, if you, uh, if you don't include South Africa or in New York State. So there are huge inequalities here in this world when it comes to energy access. So you have 52 kilowatt hours per capita in Africa, south of the Sahara, and 2,000 in New York State. So this is the fundamental equity problem and the fact that in many parts of the world, the issue is about developing energy resources for people without access today. Whether we have population growth or not, there are about one and a half to two billion people still lacking energy as it is today. Uh, of course, though, the energy issue is equally interesting from a developed country perspective. In most OECD countries, we will have a completely revamping ahead of us if we want to embark on a low-carbon path on energy. And that is a huge task as well. So we should not see this just as a development issue. There are certain you know, areas in the world where we have lack of industry or, or energy, so that's where really the problems are. We have enormous challenges in our own part of the world as well, of course. We know that. And the energy sector will completely need to change in the next 40, 50 years if we are going to address all the aspects that we are talking about here. The fact that, for instance, climate change will be a game changer. The fact that there will be increasing competition with other sectors, etc. And we should never forget the energy security definition by the International Energy Agency as well. Affordable uh, and uninterrupted, I think, are two very interesting aspects of, of this uh, definition here. I hate these kind of slides, but sometimes they are quite nice, though. They, you know, they give you at least a perspective. I was, I was trying to pull out a few things from you know, discussions going on on the issue of energy. And just to take three examples, OECD, in a fairly recent report on water and energy nexus, they came to a, you know, a simplified conclusion that there is a tendency towards more energy-intensive water solutions and more water-intensive energy solutions. Clearly a nexus issue, that we are moving to bioenergy or whatever it might be. It's there. Another one is globalization that we talked about a little bit before the break also, the fact that you can trade with food. And increasingly we do so with energy as well, regional energy markets, even globalization here, we can trade with bioenergy across the globe. And the World Trade Organization has also pointed this out. It's, it's about dealing with scarcity, fundamentally. It could be. Trade could be an important factor in this. And the last one is just about integration. And I, I, I wanted to pull it out because we quite often complain about the fact that the energy people don't understand the water. It's so important. So it's so nice when you see in a journal of energy security that they're also saying that water is so important. And we have to manage it uh, together. So this is just a starter and, and just you know, pointing to the panel that 
I want you to really, you know, continue addressing the challenge of the nexus, even though this session focuses on energy, water, and climate, but energy is so broad. So we shouldn't now forget about all these other aspects. So the panel we have here, a wonderful panel, we have in order uh, Frank Wouters, the, uh, Deputy Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agen Agency. Welcome. Uh, we have Jonas Munast, Director of Climate of, uh, and Energy Program at the Nicholas Institute at Duke University. We have Liz Thompson, uh, well known for her uh, hard work pulling together the Rio conference, not least. Uh, UN um, Assistant Secretary General for the Rio Plus 20 conference and former energy minister from Barbados. We have Jens Bergen, who is a director at the Stockholm International Water Institute. And we have Anna Delgado, technical specialist at the Water Unit World Bank. Very diverse, a lot of competences here. Uh, a rule, 10 minutes is what you have. I'm a strict moderator chair. After eight minutes, I will make some kind of disturbing sound or sign. And then you have two minutes left, and then you know that I will actually stand up and start to walk up or whatever, you know. I'm, I'm, I can be quite physical. Um, if you want to see the slides, the panel can move down. So without any further delay, Frank, can I introduce you? And give him an applause while he's coming up. It's good for the energy also. Yes. Thank you, Johan. Yes, indeed, Friday afternoon after lunch, but uh, thanks for the uh, lively uh, introduction. And uh, maybe in the spirit of the slide that he showed, uh, I think it's always um, uh, interesting to look at, at things in perspective. And uh, I live in um, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and some of you may know the Mall of the Emirates in Dubai. It's one of the largest uh, in the world, and it has, uh, you know, it, it, the claim to fame is, is the, the skiing slope inside, uh, the electrical uh, capacity of the mall, it consumes about 50 megawatts 24 hours a day, uh, which is more than the entire grid connected capacity of the Central African Republic. So just to put things a little bit into perspective. And the Burj Khalifa, by the way, is 75 megawatts, so that's even 50% more. Now, um, I, I, I must admit that as an energy person, I do not know uh, enough about water, and I've learned uh, an awful lot in the last uh, two days. So. I, I thank you for that. I thank everybody for, for that, uh, bringing us together here. Uh, but I think today we're here uh, also to learn a little bit more about energy. And that is, you know, my focus. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to also tell you a little bit about IRENA, because we're one of the youngest intergovernmental organizations. Um, we're only three years old. So um, not many people know what we are, what we do. Um, we're established in, in uh, April 2011. Our head office is in Abu Dhabi. We have a small office in, in Bonn. We're not part of the United Nations, but we are like the United Nations. So we're a separate organization, um, but we're built uh, up uh, by member states. So we have, at the moment, 129. Jamaica is the, the latest member state. They joined last week. We have uh, close to 40 that are in the process of joining. So more than 160 countries are engaged with IRENA, uh, and that is a lot more than people originally thought when the idea about IRENA was conceived. Our mandate is to help our member states, our governments, um, in advancing their agenda uh, on all aspects of renewable energy uh, and sustainable use of, of those types of energy. So that's biomass, it's geothermal, it's hydropower, ocean, uh, energies, solar and wind. And um, um, I had a you know, very interesting session uh, before lunch on the Mekong Delta, and this is something that is close to my heart. Um, you know, the, the impact that hydropower, the plans for hydropower um, that, that it has, uh, or that they have on, on fisheries and all kinds of other issues. Uh, unfortunately, if you're, if you're looking at it, um, then uh, we're, not, we're not really that well represented. So one of the things that I can uh, uh, give to WWF, if, if they engage with them, tell them that, we sh that they should join IRENA, we, we might be able to help. Um, what does Nexus mean for renewable energy? Um, there is a number of, of very concrete interactions, and I'm sure that for most of you this is, this is not entirely new. But if you're looking at the place where I am based in the, in the Middle East, 
uh, energy for water is a, is a huge issue. All the water that, uh, for example, in the United Arab Emirates uh, goes around is desalinated water. So um, a lot, 70% of the fossil fuels uh, is actually being used for water. Uh, so the production uh, of water, and then they give it away to the farmers. Uh, so if you set up a farm in the United Arab Emirates, uh, you get water for free. Now I guess everybody can understand what happens. There's a lot of inefficiency, a lot of the water basically goes to waste. So all the, in the interaction with uh, the CO2 emissions related to the water, etc., uh, it's quite dramatic. You know, the entire gulf uh, becomes more saline by the year. Uh, and this is something that uh, is, is really having a huge impact. Saudi Arabia will stop um, um, growing wheat from 2016 onwards, and they've basically depleted the, uh, the aquifers uh, that took 15 million years to build up. Now, the other interaction is, of course, water for energy, and I think we've also heard uh, many people uh, address this. Uh, I mean, you have, of course, if you're producing hydropower, you need water, but also for thermal processes, you need cooling. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And even uh, certain types of renewable energy, although solar and wind are relatively benign, um, but if you're looking at biomass, if you're looking at solar, concentrated solar uh, thermal processes, also they uh, require water. Um, I don't think there is anything uh, revolutionary in the bottom part of the, uh, of the um, uh, uh, slide, but uh, we all know that many of these things with growing population uh, and growing economies are going to basically increase in terms of impact. Now, um, if we're looking at energy, uh, there is already a nexus within energy and climate change is an integral part of that. So uh, specifically, if you're looking at renewable energy, uh, one of the drivers for renewable energy is, of course, to reduce the impact uh, on the climate uh, through the uh, reduced emission of, of uh, uh, CO2. Um, where we have to bolt on to the nexus debate is indeed looking at interaction with land use, if we're looking at biomass, if we're looking at um, the use of water, etc. So this is something that we certainly uh, have not done enough in the past and we need to start engaging more uh, in, in this field. Now what has ARENA done? Now this is a huge exercise that we did last year uh, in the framework of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative uh, by the World Bank of the United Nations. Um, there is three separate targets. One uh, is to double the share of renewable energy uh, on a global level by 2030 compared to 2010. Now, if you're looking at where we were in 2010, um, the, the total renewable energy share in total final energy consumption uh, was about 18%, and half of that was traditional biomass, which uh, already, uh, is not entirely sustainable. Some parts are, uh, but a lot of it is not. Now, if we want to double that share by 2030, uh, we need to increase dramatically, actually triple the share of modern renewables. And modern renewables are solar and wind and some of the other things, but we do need to look at biomass. I mean, bioenergy, uh, specifically in the developing world, is a huge issue. We need to find better ways of dealing with that than we are doing right now. Um, the analysis that we did in the last year, we worked with 28 countries, we looked at the national plans, we looked at uh, uh, possible pathways of achieving this doubling target on a global level. Um, it is feasible, we do not need revolutions in technology, and it's also cost effective. But we do need to find better ways of dealing with biomass, and that's smack in the middle of, of the Nexus discussion. Um, now, if you're looking at the interaction with the climate, then this pathway, we've done uh, some analysis and uh, it, it's very clear um, that if we do this, we can substantially contribute to the mitigation of, um, uh, of climate change or the emission of, of, of CO2. Um, the 450 parts per million um, level of CO2 in the atmosphere is absolutely necessary to stay on the, on the two degree uh, increase by, uh, by the year 2100. Um, and and if, we, uh, if we do this, then we're actually um, staying on that pathway. So this doubling is, in, in our view, not a, not a luxury. It's not a nice to have. It's something that we just basically need, need to do. Now, um, if we're trying to better understand uh, what the role 
of renewable energy is in the various Nexus discussions, um, then, then we see that there are serious knowledge gaps. Um, we see that there is a general lack of uh, evidence-based knowledge, and we also see that there is not uh, an abundance of tools that enable politicians and governments to make the right decisions. Um, so this is, um, you know, a field where we decided to do something, um, and one is we work uh, with the Texas University A&M um, on better understanding what the literature says on, uh, on these interactions. So we're working on that, uh, and this is something uh, that we uh, are pursuing this year and next year. Um, but we're also working with the Qatar Foundation, I have two more minutes, uh, on a tool, uh, and there is a lot of knowledge uh, specifically in the Middle East on, on food and food security, uh, because this is, of course, of, of interest, uh, but not so much on the interaction of energy with all the other things. And what we're trying to do is, is rebuild the tool, retool the tool uh, to make it a more energy-centric tool rather than a food-centric tool. Um, and the, the state-of-the-art literature review, these are the things that we're looking at. Uh, it's not going to be a scenario um, it, it's going to be a macro level, but the input of the tool is, is okay, I'm, I'm going to look for a situation where, for example, the share of cer certain types of renewable energy in my mix are like this at a, a certain point in time, and then what does that mean? What are the interactions with the use of land, with the use of water, etc., etc.? So that's what we're, we're doing right now. Um, the, um, Sorry, this is the tool. The other one is the, 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 the literature review. And um, that's, uh, I think, a snapshot of what we're doing as an agency. Uh, I think part of uh, being here is also networking. Uh, if, if some of this, um, you know, basically tangents upon what you're doing, then I would really like to, to hear. Uh, and please give me a shout and see what we can do together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was excellent, uh, really. Uh, so let's move to the next presentation right away. Jonas, please give an applause when you're coming up. That's great. Thank you. All right. Well, um, thank you. Uh, for those of you who are local, who are, um, work on UNC's campus, I apologize for bringing the, the Duke University logo um, the day before the big uh, basketball game. But that's tomorrow that we're talking today. So hopefully we can still all be friends. Um, I, uh, I work at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Our role is really to be a, a bridge between what academia has to offer and um, folks in the policy world who are making the critical environmental policy decisions of the day. My work tends to focus primarily on the U.S., primarily on energy. That's, that's going to be the focus of my talk. But, you know, I, I take your challenge, and I, I promise to bring in some water nexus issues as well. First off, we're thinking about the, the interaction between energy and climate goals here in the United States. I think it's important to recognize where emissions trajectories are going right now. Um, if you've, the, the, the longer line here at the bottom, um, that's the, the U.S. Copenhagen commitment. It's also generally tracks the, the projections of where emissions would have gone had the U.S. Congress passed um, a cap and trade bill a, a few years ago. Um, if you look at where the Energy Information Administration's projections are, the orange line there, that's 2013, the 2014 projections even bring it down just a bit. Um, we're largely on track for where the president had, had um, committed the, uh, that emissions would be going. Where now myself and a lot of other people thought that we would be on track because there would be a cap and trade bill that was that was causing dramatic changes in the U.S. energy sector. That didn't occur. What's you know this is um, a function of the economy taking a downturn, the uh, the economy being more efficient during the the uh, the. Um, recovery and low natural gas prices and um, a new regulation adopted by the U.S. EPA to deal with mercury pollutants that's causing a lot of older coal-fired power plants to shut down. So there are a tremendous number of risks facing the U.S. energy sector. And I think it's important in this context, I think it's important to, to think about this because when we look at the declaration, what I try to do is I, I, I read the declaration that for this conference through the filter of what's actually going to drive those decisions, what's actually going to drive changes in the, in the energy sector. So we have coal plants retiring here in the United States, retiring very quickly, um, which, which makes it challenging to how do you um, maintain a reliable energy sector. Uh, the default is natural gas. Natural gas prices are very, very low now and are projected to remain low for uh, a long time into the future. But natural gas prices historically have been very volatile. 
Um, even just this past winter, we have had a colder winter, so uh, especially in some regions of the country like the Northeast, uh, natural gas prices are going up. Uh, utilities and regulators are concerned about price spikes. If we rely more on natural gas generation than we have in the past, what does that do to consumer prices? Regulatory uncertainty, the EPA is starting to regulate carbon dioxide emissions. Um, there are also a number of other rules that are hanging out there. We know that the EPA is working on them. We don't know what the requirements are going to be, and depending on levels of stringency, could have a, another profound impact on especially coal-fired generation. Um, our, the nuclear fleet in this country is ending, uh, approaching the end of its second um, generation of its permitted life, so um, ending 60 years of operation for, for a lot of the plants here in the United States that will take place in the 2030, 2035 time frame, but it takes so long to build a new nuclear plant or to um, apply for getting another permit, so another 20 years of, of useful life, that, um, that those decisions have to be made today or very soon, whether what's going to happen to the nuclear generation fleet if we retire nuclear, uh, replace it with natural gas, of course, that, that results in a net increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'm going to skip down here to the, the bottom point, infrastructure planning for drought and extreme weather. Uh, that's a, a difficult one for utilities and especially utility commissioners to get their heads around. How do you, how do you make infrastructure investments uh, that, are, that are planning for these extreme events that we used to call 100-year events and maybe happening much more often uh, the, and the level of uncertainty that climate change is injecting. This is a challenge that I want to focus on because it's, it's not really intuitive. Low electricity demand. Okay, so energy efficiency in a lot of ways uh, is seen as a, as a net positive. It can also create some real challenges for the energy sector. In the U.S., projections are in the, between now and 2020, we're going to need to invest between 100 to $150 billion in infrastructure. Um, so transmission, smart grid. We're also going to need to invest about that amount of money in new generation. If we're selling fewer electrons and we have these very high, high costs, that means that, that each electron is going to cost more money um, uh, for consumption, which means if, if energy prices are going up anyway, it makes it much harder for utilities to propose and regulators to approve expensive new options to mitigate some of these risks that may be, may be farther into the future. It also makes it very hard to know whether you know, it makes sense to invest now in major large-scale energy infrastructure projects because we may not need the electricity by the time the project is built. Consumers would be left with stranded assets or underutilized assets, which again raises electricity prices, and as electricity prices go up, it makes it harder to, to move uh, towards a, uh, newer energy technologies that may have more price risk and technology risk associated with them. Challenges create opportunities. What are some, what are some ways to mitigate some of these challenges? Demand response, energy efficiency. There's a value in delaying capital investments until you get better information. Um, so, so this can allow elect, uh, electricity generators to put off decision making until we know more about the price of energy efficiency, until we know more about electricity demand. And it's also a way to, to bring more demand response and energy efficiency into the grid as a resource, more so than we, we see today. Renewable generation can provide um, uh, more diversity in the fuel mix, so help hedge against the, the volatility uh, risk of increased natural gas generation. New and emerging uh, technologies. There may be, a, now there may be an argument for spending a little bit more money for first, second generation technologies getting into the marketplace, whereas Regulators may have been more skeptical about it in the past. New nuclear, again, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily help the, the water into the problem, but it can help mitigate some of the other risks. Um, and then here on the bottom, this is we're going to see this happening as, as well. Older coal-fired power plants are shutting down, but those that are going to remain in operation are probably going to be dispatched more, so we're probably going to increase usage of the, of the existing coal fleet. Let me add another layer to this now. I'm not going to, I don't have enough time to go into the complexities of the Clean Air Act, lucky for you, but um, the, we, we don't have, you know, con, let me say it this way, Congress is not in a place where we're going to be seeing any major new energy bills adopted anytime soon, um, which means that from the policy perspective, we're left with the rules that are on the books. The Clean Air Act was adopted in 1970, 44 years ago, major amendments in 1977 and 1990, so the last time the Clean Air Act was, was tweaked, um, it was 24 years ago, okay? But we're using this law that was put in place before climate change was recognized as a major problem, certainly before 
um, the prospect of limiting CO2 emissions from the power sector was really conceived of, but we're using that tool to address an, an emerging problem. Luckily, the, the, the drafters of the law in 1970 wrote the Clean Air Act broadly enough that it, that it, is, that it can capture these new, um, uh, new technological risks and, and scientific knowledge. The section of the act that the EPA is using to regulate greenhouse gas emissions is quite broad. Statutory language is quite broad. There's very limited application, very limited precedent, which means the EPA doesn't, isn't bound by past choices and isn't bound by the court saying you can or can't do this under the section of the Clean Air Act. But it also means that the EPA doesn't have guidance, right? So there's a fair amount of risk for what the EPA's choices may be going forward. There's also a very important role for the states with our cooperative federalism framework for a lot of our environmental statutes. It means that we have 50, uh, 50 states that are gonna be struggling with the challenge, which is a way to, you know, it's, if they do engage in the challenge of reducing CO2 emissions from the power sector, it means ideas can bubble back up and conventional wisdom can shift so that maybe Congress gets back to a place where we recognize that we can regulate CO2 emissions um, and it won't destroy the economy. Strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector, from existing power plants, energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, trading and averaging, co-firing, retiring higher emitting facilities. Some of these strategies, when you put them side by side with the risks that the energy sector is facing anyway and how you may mitigate some of those risks, they start to look very similar to one another. Okay, so this is what, what we're calling a multi-benefit strategy. This is where I think that, that we can, you know, we get now into the, the nexus aspect. If you're thinking about how do you deal with the challenge of climate change and you also deal with how do you ensure a, an affordable, reliable energy sector that deals with all the risks that are on the table anyway, you can take advantage of some of these cross-cutting issues. Now back to water. Water is a much harder um, issue to tackle in the, the U.S. structure. That, un, unlike in energy where we have public utility commissions in states that are, that are approving or denying um, uh, investments, are overseeing the consumer protection aspect of energy choices, we don't have a body, a regulatory body that is overseeing water risk and the impacts largely on of water choices. And utilities have a, you know, are sometimes don't have the ability to look ahead for water risk in the, in the Public Utility Commission regulatory process. So questions, are utilities even allowed to think on a systems perspective about water impacts of their energy choices or are they, are they being driven largely by economics and the existing regulatory um, frameworks? So are they allowed to and then, and then must they? Right? That's another big question here in the Southeast. A few years ago we were within a month, uh, we had such a severe drought, we were within a month of some power plants needing to shut down because the, the, um, the, the pond, the lakes for cooling water had gotten so low and, the, and, and the, uh, the, they were higher temperature, which means it's less efficient to run through the cooling plants anyway. So if you start seeing a few plants being shut down because of, of severe drought, then that creates extreme risk across the system. And we know that, that catastrophic events tend to be caused by a number of smaller events all cascading together. So higher temperatures, less water availability, more electricity demand, especially here in the southeast where, where it can be very hot, we're using more um, air conditioning. So this is a, a, a blank space. I don't even have any bullets to put up here. It's a question to, to consider and I think that it's, it's, it highlights why it's so important to be having the conversation that we're having here these past few days. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for that very interesting presentation about the U.S. And, and also for highlighting the challenges with some of the current legal frameworks that actually make it potentially almost impossible to drive change in a positive direction. So uh, let's have our next speaker, Liz Thompson, please. The floor is your, yours. And as always, yes. My mother is 89, I can't get around um, to walk around with her, so it's Felix with whom I walk around and he's who applauds so loudly and hoots for me. <laughs> okay, so we've been discussing uh, the nexus and the presentations to date have focused 
on uh, uh, discussing nexus issues. Uh, this is some of the data that everybody is aware of, so I'm not going to spend any time on it because of time considerations. But, oh. So here we are, again, with more of the information that you've been getting over the course of the last few days. And since this is a, a very aware audience, uh, I'm not going to... Okay. What I am going to do, I've told you what I'm not going to do. What I am going to do is to talk a bit about what Nexus goals could look like. Because as you are aware, the Open Working Group uh, on Sustainable Development Goals at the UN is in the process of evolving what the new set of uh, Sustainable Development Goals will look like, how they will be languaged, the thematic areas which they will cover, and what the uh, relationship they will have to the MDGs. And here, uh, we are trying first to indicate why it is that the Nexus approach is important. And part of the challenge to date is that we really have not managed to mainstream sustainability. And the, the Nexus approach helps us to do that because often sustainable development is perceived as an issue within the purview and parameters of ministers of environment. And very rarely do ministers of finance, ministers of economic affairs, ministers of planning and development embrace sustainable development issues or sustainability as part of their portfolios or make the nexus between social development, economic development, and ecological protection. So that using a nexus approach really forces a level of collaboration and cooperation at the cabinet and policy level and at policy framing and policy uh, implementation levels, which is um, critical to the mainstreaming process. It, is also, it also creates the potential for nexus with, uh, between sectors, private sector, public sector, civil society. And therefore, uh, the nexus goals in, uh, intended to uh, apply interconnected, interconnected solutions uh, to interconnected development challenges. Essentially, we are hoping to establish and strengthen incentives for joint mapping and planning of natural resource availability, pursue and promote the use of renewable energy sources such as solar and wind, ensure that sustainable water and energy plans are developed responsibly and synergistically, ensure universal access to water, promote the use of green, efficient, and integrated systems of food production and systems and technologies which reduce water and energy use. And if you look at the declaration, you can see that this is the, the kind of language and the approach being used. And essentially, the approach intends to capture not only water conservation, uh, energy efficiency, energy use, and energy uh, conservation, but it, they attempt to make the link to food production and to uh, reducing adverse climate change impacts. Encourage and create enabling frameworks and increased incentives for business innovation in renewable energy technologies. And this is an important part of the nexus because it is going to be critical to get the, to incentivize the private sector to ensure that they are innovating new technologies which are resource efficient and which do not uh, use significant amounts of energy or significant amounts of water. Encourage the development of innovative energy technologies to address greenhouse gas emissions problems. Ensure coherence in policies and measures to address climate change. And that's not only important at the international level uh, in terms of the climate change negotiations and discussions, but at the national level uh, for policy development, uh, the, the uh, challenge exists as to how do you develop policies which bridge 
all of the concerns and which uh, demonstrate some level of um, coherence in terms of your national planning and your national strategies. And equally, it will have uh, these, all of the, the approaches that we are recommending also speak to regional uh, cooperation as well as national implementation. And having looked, therefore, at the, the declaration from this conference and some of the um, approaches and goals being recommended uh, in terms of how the nexus is created, um, I thought that I would share with you, those of you who haven't yet seen them, some of the other nexus approaches being advocated. WHO is developing a set of targets, and uh, 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 there too are doing a nexus with water, energy, and health. And I thought that I would pull one out and share with you. Universal access to clean, sustainable energy in homes, zero deaths from indoor air pollution. So you can see how they are framing the, t the nexus between energy and health. And another one, which I, I haven't pulled out, is um, the nexus between um, energy availability in health institutions, because that is critical not only to um, having positive uh, health outcomes, but in ensuring sanitation, etc. cetera. Um, the Stockholm Environment Institute has developed a discussion paper around the desirability of the nexus or integrated approach. Uh, it uh, deals with goals and targets as well. And uh, you can, if you have not yet seen it, find it at this location. And it may seem to you, as we have talked over the course of the last few days, that the nexus really is a very logical, very coherent, very obvious kind of approach. But in the way that the discussions have been evolving so far within the UN system, they're not. It is being said that the nexus approach is too complex, too complicated, brings too many things together because, of course, water and energy connect with so many other things, perhaps, with cities, uh, connects with transportation, connects with construction, so that you could create the nexus with water and energy with many other thematic areas. And there is a concern that if the approach becomes too layered and too nuanced, then it will become far more difficult to create policy instruments and far more difficult to implement. So while it may seem to you that the nexus approach is an obvious and desirable one, there is a degree of resistance and reluctance because uh, there is a, a perception that it is, it is too complex to implement and there are just too many strands that can be woven together in relation to a nexus. Sustainable energy for all, which as you know is the um, Secretary General's significant energy initiative. Uh, that the sustainable energy for all uh, speaks to the issue of, and they, they're using a nexus approach as well, so I'm sharing with you some of the approaches that are being spoken of at the international level. level. The global goal is securing sustainable energy for all, energize all, empower all. That is the macro strategy. That is the macro target. Uh, and then, uh, you can see then the, the targets into which this breaks down. Universal access to modern energy services, doubling the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency, doubling the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. So those are the targets. Um, Cross-cutting issues as far as SE for all is framing uh, would be health, water, food, women's empowerment. Uh, those are the nexus issues. Um, being approached by sustainable energy for all. The declaration from this, um, from this meeting has sort of for, used a grid format in addition to the long form which has been on the website on which people can comment. And what it is seeking to do is to put the information really into a highly visible, easily digestible framework that those who look at it in the UN system can easily pick up 
where the nexus is and what are the issues where um, collaboration might be. Now, I've just pulled energy. I've not pulled out all of them. Um, small island developing states, because of the problems that they face, because of their particular um, size, because of issues relating to scalability, and because of these challenges, um, many small island uh, developing states are water scarce or water stressed. They're all high importers of food, and food is very high cost. They all suffer very severe impacts from climate change, and small island developing states pay some of the highest uh, energy uh, costs across the globe. So that for small island developing states, a nexus approach would make very good sense. It would be extremely important, and uh, it is my contention that it is um, implementable because of the scalability and the size uh, of the, uh, with which you are dealing. And these are all critical issues for sm a small island developing state. So the nexus approach is important to, the, is important to them. Th that's just some of the information on small island developing states and I, uh, I thought that since it was winter, it was absolutely to remind you of your other options. So. <laughs> Is the nexus desirable? Yes. How do we approach it? As you can see, there are several approaches being advocated. What do you do? I think that it is important for you as an informed community and for people working in the area to try to have dialogue with civil society, the private sector, the public sector, and most of all, to try to influence the UN system in relation to the de desirability of the approach going forward as we format the Sustainable Development Goals and as we look at implementing this new development uh, framework that will come post-2015. So thank you very much and uh, good luck. Thank you very much, Liz Thompson, for, as always, a very elegant way of, of presenting some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities, and for giving examples from the health sector, from also, of course, the really, really difficult environment that you have in the SIDS, where all these kind of things come together as well. I think that is really, really enlightening. And, of course, thank you for advertising the SEI document. I have a few copies left. I'll put it here for those who want to have it. That's all the advertisement. There was a break, advertisement break. An applaud for Jens Bergen, who has taken the stage. Thank you. Uh, realizing this is uh, sort of Friday afternoon and everybody is a bit tired after lunch, uh, I didn't make a presentation. Uh, so you'll just have to look at me. I'm sorry for that. I'll try to smile as much as I can to keep you awake. Uh, of course, everything in this world is connected. I have a quote from uh, John Muir who said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And I believe that is true. So, I mean, in that sense, the nexus is absolutely a, a vital piece of, of, of thinking, so to say. But we as humans, I feel, are not really equipped to use the nexus or to work in a nexus -y way. Oh, did I push the button? I'm sorry. Um, there. Um, just take this uh, conference as an example. I mean, it is a Nexus conference, but we've actually divided it up into different sections. So we have this uh, sort of discussion today on energy. We have the uh, declaration being separated into different parts. And that is, of course, understandable because it's very hard for us, as I said before, to sort of keep all these things in mind. So we try to compartmentalize the world and work in maybe not silos, but in communities and in sectors, in a sense. And I think this is something that we need to accept. We will not be able to cover the entire nexus, but we will work in silos. And we will have to think in silos, because the rest of the world is in some way, well, I shouldn't use the word silos, but communities or sectors. Uh, 
And I also think it's useful then in that sense also to have the declaration also being sort of compartmentalized. We don't lump everything together. We're actually having water and energy, water and food and climate and all the things a bit separate because that's how we tend to think. So, uh, and this is the part where I try to keep you a bit more awake. This here is a socket. This will symbolize energy. And over here I have water. And then we heard yesterday that you have to be very innovative to be able to work in the nexus. So this symbolizes Earth. I hope it stays there. And this is climate change. This is my sort of woolen hat. And if we put it on Earth, it gets warmer. And that is a problem. <laughs> so. Uh, energy is to a large extent the cause of climate change. And climate change has an effect on water. The, the effect of climate change on water is that, I mean, we have three basic problems with water. We have too much, too little, and too dirty. And what climate change will do is we will get more of too much. We'll get more of too little, and we'll also get more of too dirty, because with more of too much, more sort of sediment, more pollutants is flushed out from uh, land and everything. So we get more pollution in the water. Also, less water is a problem in terms of quality because with less water, we have less water to dilute the pollutants that are in the water. So we'll have more of more, more of less, and more of dirty. And, and this sort of goes back because with water, with more of, with water being less reliable, the way we use energy in the water sector is to get water to where we want it, when we want it, and in the quality we want it. And since we're getting more of more, more of less, and more of dirtier, we'll probably be having to use more energy to get water cleaner and to the places where we want it. So we need energy to get water, and we need, uh, <laughs> and we need uh, water to get energy. Um, for example, in, in Lithuania, 88% of the total water withdrawals, surface and groundwater, goes just to cooling electricity production. In Hungary, 80% is for cooling electricity production. In France, 68% of all the water that is being withdrawn from natural system is for cooling energy plants. In the US, it's around 50%. So there's a lot of water that goes in to the energy sector. But, as, we, as I said before, with less reliable water, they will have huge problems in the energy sector because they need that water to produce the energy and maybe the energy we need to get the water in the state that we want it. So this is becoming a bit complicated now and it gets even more complicated. And I must tell you, I mean, this is a very, I got 10 minutes and I won't be able to dive into everything here. It's everything that I'm be talking about is very, very simplistic. It's far more complex than I'll be able to give justice to just talking here. But uh, just trying to, to follow what I'm trying to say. So we have the problem of climate change. And here we have energy being, in a sense, the cause. 82% of the energy, the primary energy that we use today, comes from fossil fuels. And we want to get rid of that. We want to sort of take the cap away from the orange that symbolizes Earth. Uh, so we would need to find ways of producing energy that is less carbon intensive. So if we take, for example, carbon capture and storage, one of the suggestions to sort of reduce sort of climate change, carbon capture and storage requires a lot of cooling. So for every kilowatt hour of energy that electricity that's being produced with carbon capture and storage would require almost twice as much, the double of the water uh, compared to not using carbon capture and storage. Uh, if we go, for example, for bio, if we take biofuels, to run an average car one kilometer on irrigated biofuels requires about 30 liters per kilometer. If we compare this to the conventional sort of diesel and gasoline, that's about 0 0.3. So it requires 100 times more water to run a car on biofuel than on conventional oil. If you go for the unconventional, the tar sands and the, the, the oil shale and things like that, it doubles the water requirement compared to the uh, conventional ones, but it's still 50%, uh, 50 times less water than we would need for sort of biofuels from irrigated agriculture. 
We have, of course, sort of hopes for the second generation biofuels where we'll be using sort of forest residues and other things. But I have a fear that bio, the second generation biofuels are the energy source of the future, but might continue to be that for a long time to come. And this is a problem. Um, we could use photovoltaics and wind. Those are energy sources that use very little water. Uh, the only water you use for photovoltaics is the water you need sort of to, to clean the slates and maybe some cooling at some stages, but that's good. The only problem with uh, wind and photovoltaics is that they are intermittent. So it, they, it means that they don't produce water, uh, energy exactly when we need it. So we would first need to have some kind of other base load for the energy that we would be using sort of on a daily basis. But also, since they're intermittent, I don't know if you all know, but all the energy, all the electricity that is used here today is actually produced right now. There's no real good way of storing energy. And we need to balance the grid all the time so that the use and the production is sort of in sync all the time. And to do that, we need very rapidly uh, uh, energy s sources that can shift very rapidly. And we have two of those today. We have hydropower, which is able to sort of balance the grid, and we have natural gas. So if we go for photovoltaics and wind, we would need probably far more of hydropower and gas. And if we want to do it from with gas, we probably would have to go into the fracking and all those kinds of things, also requiring, oh, wow, only two minutes. Jeez. Well, the dilemma to go that far is that there seems to be a choice between carbon efficiency and water dependency and water efficiency. This is not a simple solution. It's not so that we could choose sort of have more of everything, but we have really hard choices. And within the Nexus, I think we need to have a Nexus approach where we shouldn't fool ourselves and think that this is very easy. These are very hard choices. Oh, only, jeez, you want, you're pushing me too far. I had much more to say. Uh, if we go into the other side, the, the water part, um, we could also, of course, try to get the use of water far more efficient. I mean, if we could look at, uh, let's take agriculture for ex an, an example. Only about 50% or even less than 50% of the water that goes into irrigation is used in a beneficial way. A lot of it is lost in the system. Uh, and also a lot of the pr produce from agriculture is also lost either sort of in pre-harvest, post-harvest, or waste in the system. Some people say it's 50%, some people say it's a third of the food that is lost. So if you take that, it seems like we have a huge potential for saving water within agriculture. I mean, we could increase water irrigation efficiency and we could also reduce the losses. But to increase water efficiency in agriculture, we could go for, uh, for example, drip irrigation. The, the company Netafim won the Stockholm Industry Water Award last year. They have great sort of solutions to this. But to increase water efficiency in agriculture through, uh, for example, drip or micro irrigation, you would need energy because only about 24% of the irrigation systems today are pressurized. And you would need to use energy to be more efficient water users in agriculture. And the same is for reducing the losses of the agricultural produce. If we want to sort of reduce losses, we would need to have better drying systems, maybe better cooling systems for dairy and other things. So we would actually need more energy to save water. So I think only one minute left. Ooh, Jesus. Yeah. Well, actually, what I wanted to sort of, my, what I'm, my takeaway message from this is in a sense that the nexus is very complicated. And the only real foolproof solution in a sense to address the nexus as I see it is to increase efficiency. We need to use less energy. We need to use less water. But we don't want to lose sort of the benefits from that. And in order to use less but maintain or even increase the benefits from this use would have to be far more efficient. And then we need to find ways to stimulate efficiency. And uh, one way to do that, and I think it's, I, 
probably say this is, I have had a feeling during this conversation that one of the things that we haven't really addressed sufficiently, and I think energy efficiency is being discussed. You have huge sort of systems for increasing energy efficiency. You have energy labeling, you have all those things that people take into consideration when they do their purchases of everything. We don't really talk so much about water efficiency. And I think one of the reasons for that is, of course, that water is not valued properly. It may not even be priced properly. And I'm not saying that we necessarily need to have a price, a scarcity price on water, but I think also in this discussion and in the declaration, we need to be far more forthcoming on the issue of incentives to increase water efficiency. And I think pricing is one thing that we need to discuss. I think that we need to discuss far more about the regulatory options that we have, taxation and other things, to actually foster increased efficiency in the use of water. And then, of course, this is a difficult topic. It's very politically sensitive, but we need to bring it up and we need to discuss it far more than we've been doing so far in this conference. And I think also it should be sort of reflected a bit more within the declaration. And I'll stop at that. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you very much, Jens, for uh, using a couple of uh, quite simple tools to demonstrate complexity, still. <laughs> Uh, excellent, very much. Uh, Anna Delgado, the last speaker before we will have more interactive discussions, so please a warm applause for Anna. I'm not sure my presentation would be as cool, but I'll try. Okay, so I'm, I'm from the water unit at the World Bank and I'm here to present a new initiative that we've launched, Thirsty Energy, with the energy and water sectors at the World Bank. And uh, this we've already discussed before, but uh, as it's been said, we require energy production requires water, water production requires energy, and why is this a problem? Well, with, as we've been said before, 2.5 billion people have unreliable or no access to electricity, and 2.8 billion live in areas of high water stress, and in the future, energy demand will increase, which in turn can increase water demand for energy, but there's already water, water scarcity in many places in the world, and water scarcity will increase in the future due, due to population growth, economic growth, and then we have on the top of that climate change, so a very complex problem. The energy water challenge is already present, and we've seen this in the past couple of years all over the news, so power plants having to shut down, etc. what we've been discussing before. And the energy sector already recognized this issue. Um, so in 2012, the World Energy Outlook was the first time that they had a specific chapter on water and energy. And another re recent report from the Carbon Disclosure Project found out that many energy companies recognize that water is a substantive risk for their business operations. And this challenge will, will be more complex in the future if we don't act now. There have been several uh, reports looking at uh, energy increase. For example, in, in Asia, um, many reports found out that maybe the expansion for plants for coal power plants will be not possible due to water scarcity issues unless they try to find a solution. For example, you know, use dry cooling. Uh, therefore, we know that the energy sector needs water. We know that it's vulnerable to water issues. There are many water risks that affect the, the energy sector, and those risks have uh, made power plants sh to, to shut down, as we've mentioned. Have, uh, permits have been denied to many power plants or to upstream uh, facilities. Uh, these imply financial losses for the energy sector, uh, which can create also so social and political instability. And as I said, we also have climate change that will increasingly affect uh, the energy sector. Uh, for example, here in the top left, we have um, a report from WRI that they looked at the power plants located in Asia and mapped it with water scarcity maps. And as you can see in the future, most of the power plants will be located in areas that will be very water scarce. And moreover, we also have water quality issues that if not regulated or managed properly, they can become a very, a very big problem. So we really need good regulations that will ensure that we will not have negative impacts into the environment. 
And as we have also said in this, in this conference, wa water is not an isolated sector, but it's a cross-sector issue. We require water in almost all sectors. Therefore, we really need to understand the, and quantify the trade-offs to make sure that pol policymakers make decisions in an informative way, especially in those areas when we'll, we'll, we will hit a constraint, like how do, how do we decide which sector should, should get that water. For example, as Jens has said, uh, and GHG reduction policies might not always be water reduction policies, uh, uh, as he mentioned, biofuels or carbon capture, uh, dry cooling versus the cost of electricity, so it might be better to use dry cooling where you don't have uh, a lot of water, but that increases the cost of electricity and also decreases the efficiency of the power plant, so it increases greenhouse gas emission by kilowatt hour. So all these trade-offs are trade-offs that we need to understand in order to make better decisions. But as it's also been said before, these water, the ener water and energy sectors haven't been regulated uh, in an integrated way. And currently, energy planning often doesn't look at the water needs for those uh, expansion plans. And when they do, they usually just look at the, um, uh, at the value and they don't look at the competing uses or even like the, wa the water, would reduce water availability due to climate change. The good news is that there are many solutions from uh, integrated energy and water planning policies to technologies that reduce water dependency or increase efficiency. Um, and this is what we're trying to do in this new initiative, to work with countries, understand their challenges, and work with them to find solutions that fit their, their, their problems. So our goal is to really to, uh, foster a more sustainable management and development of the water and energy sectors by increasing awareness and capacity on integrated planning and identifying and evaluating the trade-offs and synergies. We've divided the initiative in three components. So first, when there's interest from the country, we, we analyze what are the challenges and the constraints, and if there's further interest, then we go and implement the case study. And we've all, we also put, put a lot of emphasis into knowledge dissemination, advocacy, and capacity building. This is our methodological approach, a lot of very long list, but I just want to highlight uh, a couple of things. This initiative is demand-driven, so we only work with countries that actually want to look at this issue. We, we don't want to produce a report and give a report to a country if they're not going to use it. So we only work with countries that, that uh, are interested in the war and energy nexus. And our entry point is the energy sector uh, compared to other other nexus initiatives that are more from the water side. We work with the energy sector and look at the, look at the tools that already the country are, is using to plan for energy and work with them to incorporate water into those tools. So we don't come with a new tool. We work with the available tools that they have and make sure that they properly incorporate water. And we're going to do this through different case studies, as I mentioned, and we're, we want to highlight we want to get different case studies that highlight different water ch and energy challenges. So from a, a country that they have high water scarcity like South Africa, but other places where there's water availability. We, so that way we showcase different problems and different solutions and that can be translated into other countries that have similar solutions and they can, they can use that information as well. Uh, where we are now, we, we just launched the initiative in January, even if we're, in, we're working it more than a year now. Um, we are started work in South Africa. We're working with the Energy Research Center there and incorporating water constraints into their energy pl planning tool. They're using a TIMES model. Um, we're going to run different scenarios and see how the energy mix changes if you incorporate water constraints in, into their model. Um, we're also now talking with Morocco. Uh, the, the recently merged water and energy, energy utility owner is very interested to look at, especially to look at synergies, how can they plan together for water and energy. Oops. Um, as I said, we've put a lot of em em emphasis on knowledge sharing, uh, raising awareness. Uh, we've created a lot of infographics, which are right there, so feel free to grab them when, when we're done. Uh, we've, blo we've blogged, um, we have also Twitter, so we're very active because we think it's very important not just to just produce material, but to make sure that people know about it and that then they use it. And just to finalize, um, as 
we know that also a lot of people are working on this issue and we don't want to repeat work that has been done. So we're also reaching out to other partners that are working on the Nexus uh, and making sure that we don't repeat work. We also have a private sector reference group to bring the private sector into the conversation and to get also a specific data from their plans, for example, for our models. So in South Africa, we're, we're working closely with Avengua. They have, for example, a CSP that they are building now, so they're going to give us the water consumption of their power plants so we can incorporate it into their models. And it's more accurate than just taking, um, taking uh, the water factors from a report, for example. So what's next? Well, it's, since there's a lot of interest in this, this started to be only a, a report, but it got converted into an initiative because we saw that there was a lot of demand from several countries. So as long as there's demand, and I guess we also have uh, funding, we will continue with this initiative and continue talking to countries that are interested in looking at this. And the outcomes of this that we hope to have is to really um, uh, deepen the knowledge in the water and energy nexus and fill in the gaps that were mentioned before that are still missing, and uh, to break the silos and make the water and energy sectors really work together. Um, this is a jointly initiative at the World Bank from the water and energy sector, so at least we've achieved that at the World Bank. Um, and to have innovative tools, that integrated tools that then the, the other countries can use. So as much as we can, we try to work with publicly available tools, so then the other governments will be, will be able to use them. And I think, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. So excellent, very, very nice. And as always, when coming from the World Bank, so efficient, exactly 10 minutes, you know, it's just amazing. And you can stay on the stage here and we can try to attract maybe the rest of the panel to come up again. You shouldn't let them try to get away now. For now, there's the questions and answers, the tough part. Now they've just been able to speak, you know, freely without being interrupted or having the tricky questions coming up. And since we have a little bit constrained time, I will actually, you know, invite you directly. I won't try to summarize what's been said. I think it's been a number of really nice presentations attracting different parts or trying to address different parts of this quite challenging nexus, water energy, but also being quite broad, both giving the challenges of countries, regions, and so on, but also sectors, I think, in a very nice way. So. Stand prepared, and I'd like to see some new faces as well, and gender balance, and age balance, and all that. Let's start on that side. Hi, thank you very much for a, a great set of presentations. I have a question for Jonas. Um, there's been a lot of uh, talk in the press about the carbon bubble and uh, stranded assets and the carbon, you know, with related, to, uh, related to, to the carbon assets and so forth and so on, institutional investors starting to worry about this. Can you give us a perspective on, 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 on that side of the, the, the energy equation? Thanks. takes new coal off the table, and I think investors a number of years ago had essentially decided that they were not willing to take the risk of, of investing in a new coal-fired power plant that doesn't have some type of, um, of strategy for, for capturing carbon. For natural gas, I mean, there's a lot of investment in natural gas right now, and natural gas releases less greenhouse gas emissions per unit of electricity um, than coal does, but certainly more than a zero emitting. Um, so if we're, if we're locking in a, an, an infrastructure that's built on uh, reliance on natural gas right now, then we're, we're essentially, we're creating path dependency for a continued um, a greenhouse gas emissions and the investment community doesn't seem to be worried about that aspect of it, so. Um, Can, sorry, I do see the, this one, so that works. Hello? Hello? Hello, yes, thank you. Uh, you said it also in your, in your presentation that it was quite challenging for the energy sector to get in the water perspective because of legal matters and so on. In the more, you know, on the national level, the policies when you're now discussing the future sort of energy landscape in the U.S., how much is water integrated into that discussion on the more sort of national level? Is there a recognition of the challenges? Um, I, I think that there's a recognition in the sense that folks may say it, acknowledge it, mm. but then how you deal with it, it, there's not a comprehensive strategy in the energy sector for, for dealing with it. And, um, and you know, again, because 
our energy choices in the United States tend to be driven you know, in, in a lot of ways by economic factors and determinations mm -hmm. at the state level, that there's not that overarching body for, for um, focusing on it. And let me, I, th I think I answered your question just a little bit too quickly. Let me go back to it. I think, I, I didn't mean to say investors aren't concerned about carbon and carbon intensive investments, but the fact that so much investment is going into to natural gas right now suggests to me that, that that's, that's not driving them away from making these mm. investments and taking advantage of this new energy resource otherwise. Okay, thanks a lot. Let's take a question from this side as well. Yeah, so uh, Jonas, your uh, presentation uh, brought a question to my mind that anyone from the panel could answer. Uh, the graph you showed on U.S. carbon dioxide emissions is shown frequently, or variations of that in the U.S. news. Uh, to make us feel sort of good about the contribution we're making here. Um, what I'd like to ask you and the panel is, it often strikes me, particularly if you're doing a single country, that looking at emissions is a really bad indicator. Uh, the way in which the United States is contributing or not contributing to the, 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 us reaching 450 ppm of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is really the rate at which we're extracting it from below the biosphere and bringing it up. As I'm sure as you and many people know, U.S. coal exports in the last couple of years have been at all-time high. Mm. Uh, we're uh, in producing more natural gas and more uh, oil on, in the country than we have in many years. So in fact, we're bringing many more carbon molecules from above the ground and putting them in the biosphere. And I just wonder, as this group of people who knows much more about this than I do, is looking to help formulate a nexus target on climate, uh, is, is there a chance or should we be looking more at the carbon that's coming from below the ground to the biosphere versus what an individual company, excuse me, an individual country is emitting. Okay, Thank taking you. a more holistic approach. Can you keep the question on mind? I will take maybe one more and, and well, they will be spread out. So have you, you have a pencil and paper? Good, good, good. Okay. Uh, it's on a, a slightly different subject. Maybe you want to keep going? I still, I think they can keep two things in mind. All right. At Thank least, you. at least two people in the, in the panel can. All right, I'll, I'll be glad to. Th thank you very much for, for these interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Eka Klein, RGM Futures. And since uh, uh, Wednesday, one thing has been bugging me uh, is trying to figure out really what's our place and our role in supporting the Nexus. And uh, I think it has become clearer as listening to presentation after presentation. Everybody mentions integration, and I said it this morning. So instead of asking a question, I want to make a proposal um, whether a role for the Nexus could not be to become a clearinghouse for, um, how, for the good practices, how to actually implement integration. I understand it's very important at the policy level that we have a clear idea, a clear vision, what integration should look like, but it's a whole different story when we are going mm. to try and making it happen. And one of the roles uh, of, of this group, I think, could be to be that clearinghouse to be uh, um, to a facilitator of learning and uh, to say it with, uh, who was it, uh, Jens, uh, the more is better, more, more learning, more sharing, more knowledge, and, and uh, I, I think uh, that that's a, a good role for the Nexus, and I want to make that motion, and I don't know whether the panelists would agree that that actually would be a role for the Nexus, or is it somebody else? And I think many of the organizations represented here could actually help us uh, make that happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So please, yes, Frank, Frank start with you. Yeah, th thanks for the question on the, um, whether we need a, an international climate nexus. Uh, well, I think uh, we already have that, which is called UNFCCC. And uh, you know, the difference I think between um, uh, CO2 and, and, and other uh, greenhouse gas uh, gases uh, and, and something like water that it's really truly without boundaries and without borders and it's truly international we, we, you know wherever you um, you emit uh, it doesn't matter it all adds to the same uh, uh, climate uh, uh, change um, so I'm, I'm not too too sure that we um, you know we, we, we need to go there uh, or at least try again because it hasn't gone anywhere and part of uh, what, what we as, a, as an international renewable energy agency have concluded in the last couple of years is to actually stay away a little bit from, from that, you know, try to uh, achieve binding targets for the reduction of CO2 uh, emissions because it hasn't really led to much other than uh, a heap of frustration. 
So our focus has always been in the last couple of years in basically trying to uh, point to the benefits um, uh, beyond uh, the mitigation of climate change. It's in terms of economy, it's in terms of uh, less use of, of uh, natural resources such as water, it's in terms of uh, many of these things uh, and, and also in terms of price uh, more and more. So. Um, Yes, of course, at the moment, because of shale, you know, a lot of the coal goes to, for example, places like Europe, but if you're looking into that uh, with a little bit more detail, um, then partly uh, that, that is also because the European utilities were able to, to basically pile up emission reduction certificates that enabled them to actually make a business case, but I think in the, couple, in, in, in the next couple of years that's going to change again. So I'm not really sure that this is a structural issue that is going to be with us for, for a longer time. But in the end, I think national governments have a very important role to play also, and regional uh, initiatives might actually be more effective than, again, this global thing that hasn't, hasn't gotten us anywhere. Okay. Any other comments from these two? Yes, please. I just, oops. I just want to uh, mention about the solution. So part of our initiative is to really showcase best practices as well. We're in talks with some people in, in Mexico to showcase an example of a power plant that gets water for cooling from a wastewater treatment plant uh, near, nearby. And then the wastewater treatment plant can, um, all the operational costs are, are met with the payment from the power mm. plant. So this is a very, very good case of an integrated way from a power plant and wastewater treatment plant that do, through our initiative we, we also want to showcase. Excellent. So we have Liz first. It is true that U.S. energy production um, is at an all-time historical high. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And the question as to how this is being presented uh, and the, the way uh, information is being uh, framed is really very important because it comes down to an issue of languaging, framing, and marketing. And you can language, frame, and market calls to the devil who has no need of them. Um, and therefore, it's very interesting that people are quite content to talk about clean coal with an absolutely straight face. <laughs> uh, it, so that, that, that um, is an indication of the issue of, of um, language. And to answer the specific question as to the role and place uh, for um, various agencies, I think that it um, relates to language. The nexus is not going to happen at the practical and implementation level unless you can get governments to buy into mm -hmm. it. And unless you can get them to create the enabling frameworks at the national, regional, and international level. And that will not happen until you persuade the current ongoing process that the nexus has value and is doable. So I think that the critical role to be played at this stage is to so frame and language the nexus that the international and the multilateral, multilateral system can buy into it and thinks that is sufficiently implementable mm. that they would want to uh, include it in the upcoming framework. Because if you miss the SDG framework, I can't see another uh, soon opening for it to come back on the international agenda in as um, doable mm. a way, just, just to make that point. Can I, just, just a very quick follow-up, because you have also an interesting background. You have been the Minister for Energy. And the Environment, yes. Yes, and the Environment, so in a way, in the nexus again. When you, because we are saying that we, we would like to, things to progress, of course, with the nexus approach. If you would have had the framework we are talking about here, what we are, you know, where, what we are arguing the nexus would contribute. When you were the minister, what would have been the difference? Actually, um, in Barbados, uh, in 2007, I stopped being minister in 2008 after 14 years. Um, I led the development of a national green economy policy. Mm. And really that is the answer, because if you have a national green economy policy, then the nexus becomes automatic. Mm. You cannot have a national green economy unless you confront the nexus issues. That is where you get your interlinkages uh, and your buy-in between the three pillar pillars of sustainable development. So I believe that even though um, coming out of Rio, it has not been as popular to talk so much about the, the um, green economy. And there is still um, divisor in, in perspectives over how you frame 
um, the green economy, that that really is the answer, that yeah. we, we really do have to, to delink um, carbon and growth and development. And we have to find mechanisms for protecting the natural environment while growing the economy and uh, securing social gains. Thank you very much. Jonas and Janice, I will allow you to, to come in first, and you can comment on the old question, but I'll also take two new ones. Can you keep that in mind? Is that okay? Okay, just to get some input, you know. So please. Um, and present yourself, I forgot to say. Yeah, Mamie Saki Harris from the Institute for Global Health and Infectious Diseases in UNC Chapel Hill, so just around the corner I'm, I'm from here. Um, my question, very great presentations by the way, my question is really more to, the, um, to John's dis uh, presentation on the pricing. I think you touched on the polls right there. And um, as we look at the sustainable development uh, goals, looking at that framework, how do we incorporate the um, issue of the proper pricing of water, the proper responsible and equitable pricing of water that takes into consideration, that doesn't put the burden on the poorer people and the poorer nations, but really more um, on the countries that have the higher consumptions of this rather scarce resource. How, how do we do that in an equitable way? And um, yeah, just taking all those into consideration. Thank you. Okay, so the whole issue of pricing between countries, of course, also in countries. Jens, I, I know you would like to comment on that, so, but please take, yes, another. Um, my name is Regina McCormack, and I'm a student at the University of Delaware, and my question was exactly the same. Um, I have found in my own research it's been difficult to find the true social value of water, so I'm interested in hearing your comments. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, of course, there are many <coughs> different users that I'm sure you would like to dwell on, Jens. Please, your favorite question, water pricing. My favorite question. I, th it was whispered here from the said, <laughs> Good luck. Exactly. <laughs> and the World Bank have really never burned it. their fingers on that one, have they? <laughs> no, I also wanted to comment on, on the previous question. Okay. Uh, it, and this sort of the role of the nexus. And I think it's very important that we don't become dogmatic and sort of treat the nexus as a religion. I had an interesting experience in Sweden a couple of weeks back because we were discussing sort of how could we sort of illuminate the nexus. And I brought up the issue that uh, the Stockholm wastewater treatment facility produces <coughs> the, the, the fuel for the buses in Stockholm. So by treating wastewater, they actually produce the buses and the fuel that the buses and taxis drive on. Also, the sludge is used to, as a fertilizer in bioenergy production for uh, well, energy, uh, forest, energy yeah. forest. So we have a nexus kind of issue there. And when I was talking to people, and then, then somebody said, no, but they haven't done it from a nexus perspective. <laughs> they didn't have nexus in mind when they did this. So that's a problem. We can't use that as an, as an example. And I think this is, it, it scares me because we shouldn't see, I mean, if things work, if we have the incentives, if they have the sort of the regulatory framework that makes these things happen, it doesn't matter if they sort of call did it, nexus. if it call it, exactly, if they call it a nexus. If it's being done, if it's practice on the ground that follows the nexus principles, I'm happy. I don't care if it, that they sort of thought it in the right way. And I think this is very important for all of us to consider mm. that it's not sort of thinking right, it's doing right, and it's doing the things. Uh, and then... Water price pricing in 30 seconds. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> well, crash course. The, the price of water is, of course, extremely difficult, and it's very hard to say what it is. And, and the water pricing is very challenging in the sense that water is a very political issue. Water is a human right. Although the issue of human rights to me is it's very interesting, but it's only, let's say, I don't know the exact figures, but something between 2 and 5% of all the water that is used in this world is actually covered by the human rights. It's used for the purposes that sort of human rights covers. Human rights does not apply to sort of water that is used for filling your swimming pool or washing your car. And it's not sort of, uh, you don't have a right to water for the commercial purposes of producing food and other things, though so it's actually for drinking water, in a sense. So I think that's an issue that we could probably step away from, sort of the, the, the social aspects, what it's worth. People should have their water, and that's the end of that story, and it should be affordable to them, and that price has to be set, and it's the responsibility of states to secure that their citizens have access to water. So I think that, that's, in, that's on the social side of it. But then when it comes to the water that's being used for commercial purposes, I mean, Everything else in the nexus is, in, in a sense, priced. I mean, we do pay for food, and food is actually also a human right. We do pay for energy. In some cases, 
it doesn't really work very well everywhere, but we pay for carbon, the carbon that is being emitted. And the only thing we don't really pay for in the nexus is water. And I think that is one of the reasons why we overuse it and we undervalue it. And that's one of the reasons why water is, in a sense, invisible to many policymakers. Because it's very simple for people when they see things coming up on sort of the, in their budgets that these have costs, but water doesn't really appear, appear there. And that I think is one of the reasons why water is being lost. So I wouldn't be able to, set, to say what is the right price on water. I mean, that depends on the situation where you're in. I would say it depends on the sort of level of extraction within the catchment that you are based. Uh, it depends on how much you would want to set aside for nature, for example, because nature can't really pay for the water, but we still need to safeguard that nature has sufficient water for the ecosystem to be sustainable. So I think this would differ from place to place, but I still think, I mean, one, one discussion you, I you had- Keep it a bit short. Sorry. Yes, Sorry. Okay. I know, because you knew, use commas there, so I would, I would have to break in. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I think one interesting aspect here, and we discussed this uh, over lunch, I think, or maybe during another break. I mean, an interesting thing is that if you have very cheap water, and free water is in a sense a subsidized water, if you think of water having an, an economic value, but if you have very cheap water that you use to produce things that you export, the ones that you're actually subsidizing are not your own citizens, but the consumers somewhere else. So in a sense, if you take China, if they use water cheaply, so to say, or for free, to produce the goods that I use in Sweden, if I want to buy a new fridge or a new plastic toy that is being produced with water that is subsidized, the, subsidized, the subsidy doesn't really remain in China, but it's actually to me. And to me, it's very odd that that system can sort of, that I'm being subsidized by having been able, in a sense, to export water-intensive industries to other places of the world, and I still reap the benefit. And that may be also a sort of response, in a sense, to the question posed on the, the extracting carbon. Okay, good. So, thank you very much. Uh, can you quickly, how many are somewhat more convinced that water pricing can be important in the price, you know, in the nexus? Raise your hand. Somewhat more convinced now. So you see, okay, you made a difference there. Excellent. <laughs> Jonas. So I actually want to get back to the question that was posed to, to me um, a little while ago. So fair point that the, the chart is, the U.S. Is, is engaging in the climate problem to the extent that we are at all in a very incremental way. Um, I think part of the value of showing that chart is that emission reductions occur for a lot of reasons, right? It, they can recur for direct policy interventions or they can occur because of economic um, interventions. I think we need a technology breakthrough, a radical technology breakthrough, in order for, a, you know, for the innovation pipeline to work. There either has to be a reason for somebody to develop the new technology because they think that somebody's going to buy it, so you create some incentives there, some kind of market demand, or you create an, an obligation for somebody to, to purchase the, hmm. the, uh, the technology at the end of the pipeline, creating demand um, up the system. I think carbon capture and storage is going to be a, a huge part of the problem that, that economic regulation that we have in the United States um, creates a barrier for getting carbon capture and technologies deployed, which means that we can't engage in the learning curve. We can't bring the cost down because we're not getting the first plant built. Uh, and as far as leaving the, the carbon in the ground or not, uh, you know, we don't have a history of leaving things that have economic value in place. We tend to, to get them out and we tend to use them, right? So, you know, so Part of the, and, and I also think if, if we're going to take seriously the challenge of providing electricity to a, the major part of the world that, that doesn't have electricity, then, then low cost resources that, that may be available within those countries or may be available cheaply to them brought in has to be a part of that energy mix. And technologies like carbon capture and storage, whether we call it clean coal or whatever else we call it, has to be an important part of the equation in the U.S. because of the factors that I laid out. I think there's a dynamic that's changing where we may now be viewing carbon capture as a legitimate technology option that may be getting into the marketplace, which can help bring prices down um, because of the factors that I laid out in there. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is what I'm going to do with the last five minutes we have. I'm going to take a final comment from there. You can reflect on that comment as well. And I will ask you also, just in a, you know, a final minute, to say if you individually, you know, representing the organizations you are representing individually, take what, what is the sort of take home message you bring, take from this session, something you learned, something you say, well, I'm going to bring that back home because we want to achieve change and it starts here with us as in individuals. So please. So uh, <coughs> my name is Shanna Freckleth and I am coming up as a 
student, um, as somebody in the nonprofit world, as somebody who um, knows the business perspective um, as an energy policy wonk myself. Um, and I hope it's not a faux pas, but I'd like to bring up current politics. And I was just wondering, we've heard a lot of success stories. We've heard a lot of how to frame the debate. Um, and currently, there's a big debate going on about the KXL pipeline. Um, and what is the nexus perspective on, on the pipeline? How important is it that we have natural gas as you know, playing a specific role in um, our movement and in thinking about the nexus? And does that mean that this is probably a frugal move for um, reasons? Or um, is it something that we should be pushing against because of the climate aspect? Or um, you know, there's obviously a lot of different climate aspects, pro and against. So um, uh, yeah, I, I was just curious um, what you're thinking about that is, um, what the current alternatives might be if you think against it, um, and basically the nexus thinking about this very politicized issue. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's a good next question again. It comes back to what many of you have raised, these hard choices, partly, that we have, you know, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, climate change, one side, water, on the other side, potentially there, the old OECD, quote, uh, you know, quote, more water. Frank. Yeah, well, in, in the end, uh, I mean, people used to uh, basically support the term uh, alternative energy, you know, as an alternative to conventional, but, uh, and conventional being fossil. Um, but there is no alternative to alternative energy because every, everything else will run out in the end. So, uh, you know, thinking longer term, uh, there is just no other way than renewable energy. Um, then the question is, how, how do we get there? Uh, and what are the possible short, medium, and longer term pathways? Um, you know, as everybody knows, we're still predominantly, uh, you, know, you know, based on, uh, on fossil fuels. Uh, so we have to uh, factor that in. Uh, in. In terms of all the fossil fuels, I think uh, if, if you're looking at their characteristics in terms of how to integrate uh, you know, intermittent renewables, etc., uh, there will always be a mix, but I think natural gas is actually uh, best suited uh, to match an increasing share of, of renewable energy. This is, is relatively clear. It's also the cleanest of, uh, of the dirtiest, uh, of, the, of the dirtier types of energy. So in that sense, um, you know, that's the good news about the, you know, increased availability of, uh, of natural gas through the shale, uh, uh, the, the shale technology that you see in, in other places. It's much better than coal. It's, um, you know, it's much uh, cheaper and, and less risky than nuclear. So in that sense, I think it's a great transition uh, opportunity, you know, before we actually have 100% renewables, which we will in the end end up with. Okay. Thank you very much. Joanna, so your last sort of... 32 seconds. Any final comments on your side? Some takeaway also. Well, I, so I, I, I'll, I'll jump to the, the takeaway part, actually. I was just um, reflecting on that. I, I think what's so fascinating about paying attention to the energy sector in the U.S. versus energy sectors in, in developing parts of the world, we're, we're replacing some of our aging infrastructure, um, but we're not, you know, we're, we're not leapfrogging the technology and, and we're not building mm. the first generations of technology. We are in a place now where the United States is going to be learning from what's happening in other parts of the world, which we're used to being the ones that are providing the example. We're going to be learning. Um, microgrid development, uh, resiliency, uh, new technologies being deployed in areas that are, that are making major investments. And this issue that I'm learning about today is, is examples of dealing with the, the water risk aspects of energy from a, a systems-based approach. I think that, that we in the United mm -hmm. States are going to be able to learn a, a a lot from on the ground examples that are taking place in other parts of the world. Thanks. That's very, very good. Liz Thompson. I think that uh, Jonas made really a very interesting point in relation to where the U.S. is going to be positioned if it doesn't change policy um, orientation. And that's critical because you have the rise of China, you have the changing geopolitical climate, and it really makes you wonder how the new landscape hmm. is going to look like, who is going to hold the strings of power, because if we are shifting to um, resource efficiency techni technologies, if we are shifting towards, the, um, towards renewable energy, does it mean and will the consequence be that the United States will no longer have its traditional leadership role? And if so, who will be the leaders 
on, on the new geopolitical mm. landscape. And that really is a very interesting question because just as certain powers controlled oil, other powers are going to control renewable energy technology. So just something to think about. Uh, in terms of the takeaway, I think it's um, important uh, for me to say to the sustainable energy for all uh, community and the multilateral system um, led by the UN that there is within communities of learning and civil society tremendous support for the nexus approach and that we really should give it serious consideration in the development of the sustainable development goals. And um, finally, all of this is sustainable development goals and the nexus approach was first raised as a real plus 20 issue by the German government when they hosted a conference dealing with the nexus. And tomorrow, right after the plenary, there is going to be a session with uh, Jorge Laguna Celis, who was in the room a few minutes ago at the back, and Felix Dodds, who was at, in the room at the beginning, and I, who wrote a book from Real Plus 20 to a New Development Agenda, uh, Bridge to a Sustainable Future. And tomorrow we will have the book. Uh, we will sign copies for those of you who have bought it so far and discuss some of the issues that came out of Rio in the context of the nexus and how we go forward, trying to look forward to the post-2015 development dialogue. Excellent. Thank you very much. Jens, your final sort of takeaway also. Yes, I think one of my takeaways, the biggest takeaway, I thought when I came here, I felt that the nexus is extremely complicated, and I go away with feeling it's even more complicated than I originally thought. Uh, and this is, of course, very difficult. Uh, one thing that has also struck me here is that sometimes I get the feeling that we are trying to solve something. We're trying to come up with a great plan, sort of the solution to these things. And in this, I'm sort of starting to think maybe we can't do that. Maybe even the collective wisdom in this room is not enough, but we should have to rely on sort of the wisdom even outside, sort of the wisdom of the crowds, and more focus on setting the incentives in such a way that our individual choices are aligned with what is good for society and that we should focus our sort of mental capacities of setting these sort of incentives so that people start behaving in line with sort of the nexus thinking instead of trying to come up with a plan beforehand and try to solve it on paper first, so to say, but actually get out there and do the things and go slowly, trying with different kinds of incentives and regulatory measures so that people start acting in accordance with the nexus thinking instead of sort of sitting back in, it's not ivory towers, but at least looking from, from afar and saying this is the way that you should, should solve it, but actually letting people to do what they can. My second takeaway message, and this is maybe too much of a commercial, but the World Water Week this year will be on water and energy, and I'm sure we'll have fascinating discussions on this, and we won't solve it there either, but I hope we'll get a slight step closer. So you're all most welcome to Stockholm in September when we'll continue the discussion. We'll need it. Thanks a lot. So it's very good, as you say, Jens. As, you know, people don't know. They, they don't need to know that they are doing the right thing as long as they do it. Huh? <laughs> it's easy. Anna. Um, I really like what Lee said, that language is very important in how we frame things. I had a very interesting conversation the other day with a climate change uh, lobbyist, and, and he said that here in the U.S., in states that they don't want to hear about climate change or they don't even believe about it, they are the states that are the driest. So for them, pushing for wind and PV, just saying that they don't require any water, mm. is the way that how it works. They don't talk about climate change, but they talk about water. And actually, for example, Texas, they had a huge drought, I think, last year, and, and they saw that wind solved uh, the issue there. Like, they didn't have to have power plants shutting down because they had wind, so now they're going for wind, even if maybe it's a state that doesn't believe as much in climate change. So I think that was a very interesting thing. Um, and then about collaboration, I think it's very interesting that here in this table, actually the World Bank is collaborating with CWE and IRENA, so I think we're actually getting there and we're trying to collaborate and to learn from each other, so that was also good to see as well. Thank you very much. Those that are interested, there are some stuff from the World Bank lying on the floor yes, here. please grab yes. it. I don't want to take it back. So. Exactly, <laughs> so I make some advertisements, you can pick it up here. However, this concludes a very energetic <laughs> session. Huh? The keystone question, oh, I, I'm not going to answer the keystone question because I'm not American, so I, you know. even though SCI has done yeah, some studies American, related to yeah. the keystone question, but that's my American colleagues. So, Jonas, do you want to say something about the keystone or can you? Uh, so, 
This is this is where I get in trouble when there are multiple questions thrown at me. Could could you remind me the key the exact part of the Keystone question? I know the the general Keystone question, but what's the I think you've kind of manner or are there better options basically a lot of what we've been talking about with um, you know having this multi dimensional perspective and how important it is, I just wanted to be okay. I was hoping that I might be able to get a perspective that you yeah. and heard that. Fra right. Frank gave a more, you know, general response to that question actually. So but I don't know. I mean but Jonas, let's, let's if you want in thirty seconds to get deeply involved into American <laughs> Um, policy here? I, so it, it depends on what role natural gas ends up playing in the long term. If natural gas is a bridge tool or natural gas is playing the role that Frank described, which is, which is providing the backstop to, a, to more um, you know, heavily deployment of, of natural gas, and, or sorry, of renewables, natural gas plays a really important role in the, in the climate solution. If, if, if we're locking in, if we're creating path dependency for a large scale amount of natural gas generation going forward, and that's going to be our one of our dominant resources that we're using for the next 30 to 40 years, and we don't have the technology to capture carbon from natural gas, and there's not a, even if we have the technology, if there's not a reason to install it, then I think natural gas is is not a bridge tool, but is is exacerbating the problem. Not it's just, the Keystone question. It's but. just as much as you can do in a session, which is one and a half hour. I'm sorry. I mean, it's really and I. Right. I, you know, I, I I agree with you, but that wasn't the question that was just posed to me. I, I can I can offer thoughts on Keystone if you guys want, but it, I, I don't know if that's a useful. Okay, I know during lunch you had a U.S. table to deal with things there uh, in the lunch. I think you can have a U.S. table again uh, during the uh, reception afterwards and really try to solve all these kind of things. And when you are ready, please come back to us because we are so curious about it. But please, warm thanks to the panel.